apologize. We are on chapter two. Um, and we are starting on uh, the second part of introduction. So <clears throat> let me get to where I can see my chat again. Okay, um, and Lindsay, I want to say right now, um, thank you for that. That shows a huge level of self-control. Uh, <clears throat> so develop develop all of these things through training, experience, and dedication. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. I apologize, you guys. Um, <clears throat> hold on just a second. All right, so let's talk about infectious disease. Um, it's a medical condition caused by an organism within the body, right? Okay, it's communicable. We understand that. If anyone knows what communicable diseases are, it's it's us, right? We understand COVID. We, un we really understand COVID. Flu, whatever other bug is going around right now that is just decimating a lot of Americans, especially like in the South. Um, <clears throat> but we understand that it's, you know, you can have a vector, which is, one that is given to you via an animal, like a flea bite, rat bite, or something like that, or um, from person to person. You know, you cough on your hand and you touch the um, the gas pump, <clears throat> and then somebody immediately comes in and they grab the gas pump. Um, that's also considered a person to person. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you guys cough and you, well, when you sneeze, it's 100 miles an hour coming out of your mouth. Um, Makes you really want to just kind of duck and cover when someone sneezes in the room. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about infection risk can be reduced by certain things. First off, immunizations. If you're in this class, you've been immunized, immunized by you know certain different things that you just have to have before you get into the medical field. Uh, protective techniques, uh, especially you guys in advanced EMT, you're gonna learn about what you should do with needles. Um, hand washing, biggest thing ever, because guys, there are things out there that you know our um, <clears throat> Our alcohol-based uh, sanitizers that we put on, it's not going to kill it. You have to use uh, antimicrobial soap to get rid of it. So in, in cases when you have the ability to wash your hands, like say at a hospital at the end of a run, please go do that. Um, quick question, is your chapter two workforce safety and wellness? Hold on just a second. Um, uh, yes. That is correct, uh, Katina. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Okay. Um, when protective measures are used, risk to provider is negligible. What does that mean? It means that it's lessened considerably. So if I wash my hands after I've dealt with somebody who has a communicable disease, I'm less likely to bring that back to myself, my partner, uh, the place that I work, and my family, which let's be honest, that's that's what's the most important part, right? Is just not spreading whatever that is. Uh, proper cleaning and disinfecting of the ambulance and equipment will prevent transfer of illness between patients. Guys, I just want you to know, I understand. <laughs> I understand about cleanliness in the back of an ambulance. I understand. I am the I am the stickler. I'm the person that's like, did you wipe down? even the inside of the blood pressure cuff. That's me because I I don't want to bring anything home to my children. I don't want to bring anything home uh, or give anything to the elderly person that I'm picking up that's going on a dialysis transfer. I don't want to give anything to all of these other people. And there are some times when I have gotten in the back of an ambulance and I'm sure probably one or two of you have had the same, same issue where you've looked up at the ceiling and there might be a spot of blood up there. Um, and that just goes to show that th th things, bad things happen in the back of that ambulance, but we have to be cognizant after the call is over with in disinfecting and making sure that we have purposeful movements when we're in the back of that truck to stop the possibility of, of having anything transfer over to A, the next patient, or B, ourselves, partner, ambulance company, you guys get drift. Um, inform other providers who may come into contact with a patient of potential risk. So if you have someone, uh, you know, there's a lot of people uh, back in when I first started, to be completely honest with you, um, HIV was such a huge deal. Um, AIDS was such a huge deal. 
And now it's kind of like, oh, okay. Oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. I appreciate it. Yes, I'm going to be careful when I am um, when I'm doing anything that's going to cause uh, not a puncture of sorts, or if they are, um, you know, if it's trauma related. Absolutely, of course. But I'm careful with everybody because I automatically assume everyone has something that I don't want, and that's the best way to protect yourselves. Um, but <clears throat> it is okay, just like when we are uh, handing off our patients to um, if you're an EMT and you an advanced EMT comes on scene, you have to hand that patient over to them. An advanced EMT has to hand that patient over to a paramedic and so forth and so on, and even into the hospital setting. And so when we talk about these patients, you don't just walk into a hospital, you don't just walk in uh, or you have someone walk on a scene and you start yelling out patient information like, yeah, this guy's got hepatitis. That's wrong. So we're gonna use discretion and I'm not saying get in the middle of somebody's ear and start whispering, but be just dis be discreet. And if you need to put all of that, not if you need to, when it comes, uh, when it's ap applicable, go ahead and put everything down in writing in your PCR because that is a legal document. I know we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> okay, so routes of transmission. There's several. Uh, all contagious disease diseases are infectious. That's simple enough, right? But not all of them are contagious. So you can have some that are caused by an infection, right? And a pathogen is a microorganism that is capable of causing a disease in a host, and it's going to live there for as long as it can until it can transfer to someone else. And then that's when we have mutations also. So let's talk about uh, from transmission from one person to uh, from one person to another. You have your direct contact, which is bloodborne. You have your indirect contact, and that's your needle stick. So understanding that blood is direct, but we're using a component that has the blood on it to get it into another person's body, and that's why that's indirect contact. And of course, airborne transmission, you're coughing and sneezing, your foodborne transmission, that's your contaminated food, and that could be a number of different things, salmonella, and a vector-borne transmission, like your fleas, rats, raccoons, dog bites. And so you guys see how you should be covering your mouth. Uh, one thing COVID has definitely taught us is how to cough in our elbow, I believe. That's one. That's another thing that COVID taught us. Okay. So risk reduction and prevention, um, all EMS personnel are trained in these things, handling bloodborne pathogens, approaching patients who may have infectious diseases, and training is required by OSHA. And if you don't have OSHA, um, don't worry, you will. Um, <coughs> OSHA is, uh, they handle everything uh, from the smallest thing and they have, hey, this is a requirement for XYZ. For your firemen, they have NFPA standards. They have OSHA requirements along with it. If you work on an oil rig, there's OSHA requirements. And in, of course, in ambulance companies, there's OSHA requirements for everything. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So the CDC developed standard precautions to prevent workers from coming into direct contact with germs. And remember when I said, I assume every person is potentially infected and I don't want it. Okay, this is where this comes from. And you notify a designated officer if you are exposed. Now, let me go ahead and back up and tell you, let's make sure we understand standard precautions are gloves. Okay, that's part of my standard precautions. Before I get out of my truck, I'm putting on my gloves. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to lie. When I changed when I changed careers from being a paramedic to a nurse, I was like, you guys don't wear gloves. And they're like, no. And it's it still gives me the heebie-jeebies um, not to go and touch a patient without gloves on because this is something that's just kind of ingrained in my soul of I don't know what I'm going into. I could be going into a ditch. I could be going into a very... Uh, filthy home. Um, I could be going into the Ritz Carlton with the richest person in the world and they have the worst disease. Okay. It doesn't matter, but I don't know what I'm going into. And so I always want to protect myself. <clears throat> and that's what standard precautions really mean. 
And so it says notify designated officer if you're exposed. So it could be an exposure to someone with tuberculosis. It could be a, uh, a needle stick. So all of those different things of when you are exposed, you definitely want to notify your designated officer and that's going to be your protocols. And generally speaking, you're going to call your, your supervisor. Okay, so proper hand, hand, um, mm, hand hygiene. Uh, simple, most effective way to control disease transmission. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I haven't looked at your test. I haven't looked at any, any of the questions because that's not how I like to teach. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to see this again. You, you just will. So you need to know that proper hand hygiene and hand washing specifically is the most effective way to control disease transmission. Um, it, it just, it absolutely 100% is. Yes, it's great to have our uh, alcohol-based um, uh, stuff in the back of the truck, but it doesn't kill everything. So <clears throat> there's really just no true substitute um, for hand washing if you can have it. Um, and like I said, you go to the hospital. There you go. There's running water. Okay, so gloves, that's our minimum standard for our EMS personnel. You do have your vinyl and latex. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of people that don't use latex at all because of such a high, uh, <clears throat> a high incident of people that are allergic to latex. I'm allergic to latex. Um, and so uh, that's pretty difficult to find in um, some rural areas. You may have rural areas that are still kind of holdouts on that. Um, <clears throat> but this protects your hands and wrists from injury uh, during rescue uh, and depends on what kind of glove also. Uh, so there's a difference between our, uh, our vinyl latex nitriles versus uh, NFPA standard uh, gloves that a fireman uses, right? <clears throat> now, eye protection is big. Uh, so, of course, splatters is a uh, blood splatter is such a big deal that you will say um, gunshot wounds. Really, uh, I have been splattered a couple of times and I have been thankful for the fact that I was able to look away quickly enough um, because I was one of those people that's guilty of not wearing my eye shields and you get splattered once and that's all it takes. Um, <clears throat> but goggles are your best bet. And the reason for it is just like glasses that it hugs this area. Now, <clears throat> of course, a face shield is good, but your goggles have kind of like this overlap right here. So it, it does shield a little bit better. Uh, your face shields, however, have about that much room for something to fall into. So that's why they say that, go that goggles are your best, um, your best bet. Gowns. At, when there's extensive blood, when there's other um, uh, human um, bodily fluids that are uh, there, such as childbirth. Wow, that's a whole lot of stuff on the ground when there's childbirth. Um, so you definitely want to put on a gown. And then there's booties and stuff like that also that go with the, in the OB kit. It's very worth your while to dress as appropriately as possible for this. Um, uh, not practical in many situations, though, and it may even pose a risk for injury, especially if you're trying to navigate into a smaller area. Uh, if you're more worried about a gown being around your body um, and it's potentially causing an issue, then that's really not the most effective way to use a gown, if that's if that makes sense. Okay, masked respirators and barrier devices. Now, we've learned a lot about the different kinds of masks uh, from our wonderful world of COVID, but I want you to know what National Registry needs you to know. So we use our standard surgical masks if there's fluid, that's that's possible, right? You can place a surgical mask on the patient with a communicable disease, especially if it's like somebody that's got TB. We want to use a HEPA respirator on these people, okay? And the reason for it is because we're protecting them from giving it to us, and we're protecting ourselves also from getting it. And then you have your mouth to mask. Um, 
you have your mouth to mouth resuscitation may transmit diseases. So we don't really do a whole lot of mouth to mouth anymore. There are pocket masks. And of course, our BVMs are a bag, uh, bag valve mask, which this just says bag mask device. Um, <clears throat> devices are uh, contaminated after exposure to a patient. And so we just dispose of those pretty simple. And you can get one of these little guys right here for almost nothing. A lot of different agencies do have those available, especially for the first responders in the field, especially the, the volunteer fire departments and things of that nature. Um, so you may, you may run into one of those. Now, let's talk about proper disposal of sharps, okay? So this is such a huge deal. Because remember, we don't want to go back into that indirect exposure. So we want to avoid getting any type of communicable disease that's carried in the blood. One of the a couple of the big ones, of course, are HIV and hepatitis. But let's talk about some rules. We do not recap. Okay, let me tell you something. When I went through uh, paramedic eons ago, we were taught that if you're going down the road, you put both of your elbows on your knees and you recap this way. Not kidding. It's just ridiculous. I don't know how many people got poked from that. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Other people are like, oh, well, you put the cap down on the seat and then you then you just kind of follow and try to get why. Now, now my seat has holes filled uh, to the brim because someone's hitting bumps while we're going down the road. So just don't do any of that. Don't break them. Don't bend them. Don't do any of that with a needle. Just don't. Um, they say use needleless systems and IV catheters with safety systems. And there are a lot of those in place. However, there are some that are very rural uh, ambulance companies that they don't use needleless uh, type catheter systems. So you need to be aware of that. But dispose of used sharp items in approved closed puncture proof containers. So that's a sharps container right there. That's your best friend in the back of the truck. Um, and you wanna make sure that that is anchored safely somewhere in the back of the ambulance also, because uh, you don't ever want that to become a issue in case of, uh, I'm a worst case scenario kind of person. And I have been in ambulance wrecks before, and I promise you, that I didn't realize how much a sharps container will move in the back of a truck uh, along with the life pack. So we want to make sure to not only dispose of our sharps appropriately, we also want to make sure that we anchor our sharps containers. Okay. Employee responsibility. Um, and we're going to take a break in about 10 minutes, guys. Okay. Um, okay. Quick history. I don't know telling you used to take needles and stab them into the bitch. That is true, Jared. That's 100% true. I come from that generation of paramedics. It's ridiculous. Um, and they were having to get rid of pads over and over again. So it cost the ambulance companies lots of money. Okay, so your employer cannot guarantee 100% risk-free environment. Well, no one can, okay? I can't promise you that you're not going to walk out of your front door and not get hit by a bus, okay? I also can't promise you that you're going to pass the next ne the next test. I can't. I can't promise you any of that. Can I tell you, hey, if you look both ways before you cross the road, that there's a less possibility of you getting hit by a truck? Absolutely. Can I also advise you to go ahead and study as much as possible and read your chapters and understand what's going on and re-listen to the lecture in order to do really well on your on your next test? Absolutely. But I can't 100% guarantee it. Just like they can't guarantee that you're going to be perfectly fine when you go to work. So risk of exposure to communicable disease is part of the EMT and advanced EMT's job. It's just part of it. And your risk for infection um, is not high. That's the, all we want. We want to limit as much as we can. So employers are going to follow the OSHA requirements, CDC, NFPA, and all of the other NACRAMs, okay? Um, and you want to know what, A, your exposure control is and your infection control plan. You want to know what those are before you really step foot on the ambulance as a, as a card-carrying EMT, advanced EMT, whatever the case may be. So we're establish, establishing an infection control routine. Now, what is that? Okay, well, here we see a gentleman putting a bloody white linen into a red bag. Everyone here pretty much 
probably knows that the red bag means infection control, that that means there's a bloodborne pathogen on it, or there's some sort of bodily fluid on it that can be that's considered contaminated. So infection control is going to be a part of your daily routine every single day. We're going to clean the ambulance after every single run. Remember the inside of the blood pressure cuff. Okay, I'm a big stickler about that. And this should be done at the hospital and also whenever possible. So keep that in mind too. Um, immunity, even if germs reach you, you may not be at risk for infection. Uh, immunity comes from several different ways. Of course, immunizations and vaccines and recovering from an infection of that germ itself. And sometimes immunity is only partial. So uh, the case of... of and, and this is not to get political, do not care one way or the other, but you have one side that says um, vaccines uh, for COVID work 100%. Other people say, no, there are breakthroughs. We know there are breakthroughs, but there are people that uh, still religiously go and get um, their, uh, their booster shots. And they have been hit with COVID at the same time as other people who don't have booster shots. And the people that don't get the booster shots are much sicker. So uh, that's when we're talking about that immunity is only partial type thing. Um, humans cannot form immunity to uh, some diseases. We're not going to get an immunity to Ebola. It's just, it's not happening. Okay, so that's one of them. All right, preventative measures. Uh, maintain your personal health. So let's pump our brakes for just a second and talk about our personal health, okay? Um, and this is EMS, uh, not necessarily fire, but EMS related. A lot of people in EMS do not eat right. They are um, albeit couch potatoes. And I say this with love in my heart because I come from a fire department background that, that I later on left and became EMS and the mindset changed. So when we talk about personal health, we also talk about the fact that uh, yes, is it is it a bad situation for us in EMS that sometimes the only thing that we can go get is uh, a cheeseburger through a drive-through? Yeah, that's pretty terrible. I understand, I've been there before. But you can still help yourself into being a little bit more healthy with just a little bit of forethought, okay? Uh, pack you a small lunch, pack you a small snack box of some sort that doesn't have to be refrigerated that you can just put on the truck and something that's healthy or healthier for you than say uh, something that can be chunked out of a window at you and say, you know, thanks, come again, okay? Um, receive immunizations and make sure that they're on time. Once again, we're talking about boosters just a second ago. If that's something that you think that you need and that's something that's required, then go ahead and get them. Um, get your TB skin test done yearly. Always follow your standard precautions. Um, <clears throat> you're not always going to know when someone has a communicable disease. You're just not. Um, and, and that's just how the world works. So, um, Let's go through a couple more and then we'll take a break at, at uh, seven o'clock, okay? General post-exposure management. So what happens if I get exposed to blood or bodily fluids or I get stuck by a needle or something, okay? First off, according to National Registry, we are to turn over patient care to another EMS provider. Why? Can anyone tell me in the comments why you think we should do that? What was the question again? The question is, it says if you were exposed to a patient's blood, bodily fluids, or anything else, it says to turn over patient care to another EMS provider. Why do you think that is so important? I'm hearing you'll get distracted. Okay, that's a good one. Reduce further exposure. Okay, good. Uh, you have to get care. All right, we're getting close. Uh, you won't be completely focused on patient care. You'll be worried about your own exposure. That's a good one uh, for both us and the patients. Okay. Um, you can get checked out. Uh, don't take it on the patient. Okay, well, no, we're not going to take it on the patient just because we get exposed. Um, and that's another thing about, hey, we have to control our own selves, right? 
to clean yourself before it can spread further. Must report immediately and receive proper care. Okay, now we're getting kind of closer to what I was saying. Um, it limit the time, the amount of time for your exposure. Y'all are all kind of hint getting on that exact, like the exact reason. So we wanted to turn over patient care to another EMS provider so that we can go get care because when we started this, I said, I have to take care of my health before I can take care of theirs. That's it. OK, so we need to make sure that we limit our exposure and uh, when it's safe to do so, clean the exposed area. That's a big thing. <laughs> oh, pardon me, y'all. OK, so uh, if you have been pricked by a needle, you thank you. Um, if you've been pricked by a needle, you need to go and, and I'm just going to use my finger as an example and you need to push as much blood out as you can, wipe it off and get some hand sanitizer on there, get some alcohol prep pads on it, something. Get, wash your hands, go get your blood drawn at the hospital, get on antivirals if necessary. There's a lot of different things that can happen there. Well, what if it gets in your eye? Flush your eye immediately, go get seen about immediately. Cry, <laughs> Jesse, no. Um, actually, yeah, you can cry, that, would, that might help, I don't know. Um, okay, um, so activate your department's infection control plan. So what does that mean? First and foremost, I'm calling my supervisor. I speed dial. Hey, yo, guess what happened? This is bad. And they're going to say, calm down. I got you. I'll see you at the hospital and we're going to do this, that and the other. Um, but why are we doing early activation? It's because we want to reduce our risk. And you guys hit the nail on the head on that because we want to, to limit our risk of more exposure. Do you guys do good? Okay. Illness and injury prevention. Table 2-4 has the top 10 causes of death in 2015. Now, granted, I know that's like almost a decade ago, but uh, heart disease is still number one. Cancer is still number two. Just going to throw that out there. Uh, stress is further up than that, okay? <laughs> because now stress is considered one of the main reasons of, of causing heart disease, stroke, um, and uh, some other stuff, right? So advanced EMTs and EMTs can be involved in prevention. And in most areas, EMS providers are considered high profile role models. So I'm gonna pull off of, the, off of this right here and just talk about we are role models. Did you know that? <clears throat> Did you know that when you step off that truck that you are a role, role model? Did you know that uh, they look at the way you're dressed and they immediately, within three seconds of looking at you, have made a decision in their head on whether or not you're professional enough to take care of them? Yes, you're a role model. And if you come out and you've got part of your chili cheeseburger on your, your shirt because you've run 15 calls in a row and you didn't have time to eat, um, but your shirt is half untucked and you look like you haven't showered in three days. That's not very good. Do you like, and I know you guys are going to tell me in the comments, no, that's terrible. Um, does it happen? Yeah, it does. There's a reason I'm giving the example. I've seen that person in the field. Okay. So we don't want to do that. We want to limit ourselves as doing something really unhealthy, not just being, um, we want to bathe, obviously. No one wants to stink, okay? Uh, but furthermore, when we talk about being role models, we also want to show up and be a little bit more fit than we were the day before. We want to be a little bit more cognizant of how we approach life, not just in the way of getting to this particular call. We want to approach life in the fact of, hey, I don't want to be you know, uh, in 20 years being picked up by another ambulance all the time because I've made all these unhealthy choices. And so I need to be a role model. So that's what we're talking about here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> safety or scene safety and personal protection. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to kind of ramp up and, and get a little bit faster when we come back from the break. Um, <clears throat> just to let you guys know. Um, so begin protecting yourself as soon as you're dispatched. What does that mean? Well, that's simple. I'm I'm in the truck. I'm gonna wear my seatbelt. I'm yeah. I'm gonna drive a little bit faster than than uh, the road rules, but I'm gonna get there safely. 
Um, it doesn't matter what the call is for. I want to go home at the end of the night. I want my partner to go home at the end of the night. So we're not going to be rampagey going crazy in the truck, right? Um, then we're going to ensure our equipment is restrained. That is such a huge deal. I hope none of you ever have uh, what has happened to me before, being in a wreck and having things hit you in the middle of the wreck. <clears throat> it's not fun. And you're going to don your PPE. Now, some of you may not know what don means. That's not a dude. Okay, that means to put on. And to doff, D-O-F, means to take off. So you will see that, those terms. Um, <clears throat> continue to protect yourself once you're on scene. So what does this mean? Oh, okay, well, we want it to be uh, well-marked and well-lit. Not always the case, especially in the middle of the ditches, in the middle of the night. Okay, I understand. But we're going to try our best, right? So we're going to turn on the scene lights. Uh, we're going to get out flashlights. We're going to do the things that we can to protect ourselves, right? Okay, place warning devices if, you th if that's applicable. Park at a safe, convenient distance. Remember, when you're going to park, and this isn't part of, of this, but um, <clears throat> part of your book, but when you drive to a scene, you want to park your vehicle in such a way that if another vehicle comes and hits your vehicle, that it ricochets off instead of hitting the scene itself. Uh, firefighters are real, it's really grilled into their, their heads about that. And check for vehicle stability. You don't want to go crawling into a vehicle that might turn over or might fall into a ravine or, or whatever the case may be. Okay, so I'm going to stop at scene hazards and we're going to take a real quick 10 minute break. And if you give me just a second, I'm going to put on my, my timer. And when my camera comes back on, we will be back from break. Okay, guys? <clears throat> and we're going to start that now. Okay, guys. Let's get back to it. Hmm. All right. So, being clumsy tonight. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started again. And we're going to go a little bit faster um, just because I want to kind of catch you guys up. <clears throat> I'm not going to leave you behind by any means. but um, scene hazards. So let's talk about hazmat. You can identify what that is from a distance with those placards that are on the back of these vehicles. They're on um, <clears throat> they're on trains and things of that nature. And you can use these. You can look at them from a distance with binoculars. But you want to stay uphill and upwind. What does that mean? We want to be as far away from it as possible. Um, but you also want to be upwind from it because you don't want the wind coming back and hitting you, right? And you can use the uh, DOT's ERG, Emergency Response Guidebook. And look, unless you've been trained to enter into a hazmat situation, just don't do it. Those are specialized teams that are that work with the fire department. There's ChemTrack. There's all sorts of different place people that can come in and handle that. That's not your your thing, okay? Uh, vehicle collisions, that's huge, okay? So some of these are the most unstable and pot potentially lethal situations. Literally, uh, <clears throat> not long ago, um, there was a person who lost their life. And I mean, we're talking two, three weeks ago, two weeks ago <clears throat> in uh, Alabama. And uh, from a vehicle collision, they pulled over on the side of the road to help. And um, they were they were hit, and it's a very sad situation. And that's not the first one. There are multiple uh, things of that nature uh, that happen, and so we have to be very cognizant of our surroundings as best as possible. Um, so consider traffic hazards also, parks so you can easily leave the scene. You don't want to get blocked in. Uh, be uh, conscious of the flow of traffic. Is it is it going really fast? Uh, is it two ways? What's going on? Be alert for any other hazards because not just that, like if you're on an interstate and people are still going interstate speeds, then that means that the debris that is on the road can be blown back onto you or onto your patient and neither one of those are good situations. And make sure you use full protective gear, okay? Electricity, if there's down power lines, back up. That's not my job. I don't have qualifications to mess with that. I'm not going to. I'm going home tonight. Mm -mm. Nope. No, thank you. That's okay. That's beyond our scope of the advanced EMT or EMT, EMR, paramedic, RN. I don't care what you have behind your name. It's not cool. Uh, so mark off your area as a danger zone and just don't approach it. 
and make sure you make the right phone calls. Uh, lightning is another one, okay? So you can get it through a uh, direct hit. Or it could be a ground current. Uh, there can be repeat strikes. They say, oh, well, lightning never strikes twice in the same place. Yeah, it does. Um, to avoid being injured by ground current, stay away from drainage dishes, any moist areas, and small depressions and fields and things of that nature, and wet ropes. Um, and if you believe a strike is imminent, move to the lowest possible area. So if you feel the back of the, you know, your hair on the back of your neck standing up, just hit the floor. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, and if you have to delay, if you have to delay rescue missions because of this, go ahead and stop it. Because remember, we, we need to go home, right? We can't help those because if we're harmed, right? Um, so keep that in mind. Fire, of course, fire is a huge win. Uh, one of the biggest hazards that we run into with fire isn't necessarily the fire itself, it's the smoke afterwards. And it's how much toxic fumes that, that there are, the toxic gases that you uh, can be exposed to. And of course, fire itself is naturally bad, right? Um, but you have to be trained in the use of the airway protection and have it available if necessary. And in a vehicle crash, fuel and fuel systems are also hazardous. So think about that. When you are dealing with carbon monoxide, that's another one. And that's going to be the byproduct after the fires are out. And we're talking about cyanides also along with that. Uh, but that's, you know, carbon monoxide is that colorless, odorless, little guy that'll snatch all the oxygen out of your body and it's not cool um and we'll talk about carbon monoxide poisoning later on violence is another one a lot of people go to these calls on the ambulance because of a civil dispute uh, so it, it can be um domestic it can be a crime scene there's so many different things that you can come into and remember when you have a large gathering of people that people can turn hostile very quickly and it, mob mentality is a real thing so be cognizant be very aware of where you are where your ambulance is and where your patient is um when several agencies respond know who's in command that's so important. You can't just automatically assume it's you, okay? You need to find out if you're the fifth person on scene. It's obviously not you, right? So you need to find out who who the, the leader over whatever it is is going on. <clears throat> uh, don't disturb a crime scene evidence unless it's absolutely necessary, okay? If a perpetrator still is at the scene, could reappear and threaten you or your partner, what if there are hostile patients in their home environment? They are much more dangerous. They know where all the weapons are, right? Never, ever, ever enter an unstable environment. Stay back. Call for help. Get PD, SO, whoever in route that you need to. And once again, um, do, do not disturb a crime scene evidence unless absolutely necessary to care for a patient, okay? Behavioral emergencies is another one. Yes, we do have um, people that are uh, psych patients. There's a whole chapter on that. Uh, emergencies that they don't really have a clear and physical cause. So it's a, a mental issue. And in some cases, it can be just from hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, head trauma, hypoxia, toxic ingestion, overdoses. There's a lot of different reasons, not just psychiatric. So a lot of the behavioral emergencies that we do run into really aren't that the biggest threat possible, but we definitely want to evaluate them and make sure that they don't become violent. If they do, then we need to worry about how we're going to react to that violence, right? So protective clothing uh, prevents injuries. Now, you guys see a fireman here. We all know uh, what that does, right? So uh, before a fireman goes into a uh, on shift, he's supposed to inspect his vehicle. He's supposed to, or she is supposed to inf inspect um, their their clothing to make sure that there's no tears or or anything like that, right? Well, guys, it's the same thing with us, okay? Uh, you want to make sure that your gear is good to go before you get out there. Um, think about if it's cold weather, which it is. The South was not ready for this, so if you're in the South. Uh, it's like 11 degrees outside right now. It's ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> cold weather, 
clothing can be like three layers. So be be ready for that. Turnout gear, of course, we already know what that's for. And then here's your gloves. That protects from your heat, cold, and cuts. Helmets protect from falling objects. And boots, of course, steel-toed are preferred. Um, I will definitely say water repellent fabric is my most favored. Eye protection, you want those glasses with the side shields. And then, of course, you can have your face shield and goggles um, when using tools. Ear protection, skin protection. Yeah, SPF 15 is a big deal. Um, going on dive calls uh, in the middle of the summer with no shade. That's a big deal. When you, when you get a sunburn on your fingers, you remember these things, okay? Body armor, that's another one. Now, let's talk about stress. Whew, it's a big one, right? I don't know if you knew this or not, but EMS is a high stress job. I kind of feel like that's kind of uh, obvious and self-explanatory. But it's important to know the cause of stress and how to deal with them. So we're going to talk about stress as in, in, it impacts the stressors on our physical and emotional well-being. They include emotional, physical, uh, environmental situations and conditions that can cause a variety of uh, physiological, sci uh, physical, psychological responses. So, okay, so let me back up. Now, of course, I read that little snippet right there, right? Uh, if I feel a type of way when I walk into the office or into um, uh, my home away from home, which is what I used to have when I worked at a station. Uh, if I if I walked in and I felt a type of way, the whole shift was terrible. If I walked in and I felt excited and happy, the whole shift was amazing. So your emotional state when you first begin is a big deal. Your emotional state throughout the duration of the time that you're on the truck is a big deal, okay? Uh, and your physical situation, like how are you physically? Are you, uh, are, are you burned out and sick because you've been eating junk food? Um, or you know, what's going on there? So different things, okay? Now let's talk about GAS, and that's General Adaptation Syndrome. So we have an alarm response to stress. What does that mean? First thing of the alarm response is, and, and you can literally think about it as an alarm is going off. What's the first thing that happens when an alarm goes off? First off, it freaks us out. I don't care how great of a person you are. You get freaked out a little bit. And your heart rate goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. Your respirations go up. Your pupils will dilate. Adrenaline. That, thank you, Tammy. Exactly. It pops off. And it's kind of like when that alarm goes off, it's kind of like, where's the dinosaur in the room? Who's coming to get me? Okay. Time to act. Got to get up. Go. Right? Then you have reaction and resistance to stress. So we have the reaction, but then we have a resistance where we just keep on and 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 keep on. And then we have a recovery or in the case of prolonged stress, we have exhaustion. That's right, Lindsay, fight or flight. Exactly. And so when we're in our recovery, okay, recovery is good, right? Recovery means we're calming down. We're doing okay. We're getting into our zen, but exhaustion. Exhaustion is different. Exhaustion is a, a very ugly animal. And exhaustion is where, um, in the literal in sense of the word, um, you become so enthralled with this, the, the adrenaline being so high for so long, with your fight or flight being so high for so long, that your body says, this is enough. Stop. Because what happens? So let's let's go down into a physiological state. Now, I know we haven't gotten the A and P yet, but your heart rate gets high during the initial alarm response to stress, right? But if I have a reaction and resistance, and it's a resistance, and then I continue, 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 and then I go into exhaustion, that means my heart rate stayed up this entire time. It also means my blood pressure has, too. Also, my respiratory rate. So what do you think that does to our cardiovascular system? I know it causes really bad stuff to happen. So this is why stress is one of is in the top 10 things that kill you. OK, so and I already talked about that. Uh, cool, clammy skin is one of them, too. And perspiration, tensed muscles, things of that nature. OK, um, and you have your acute stress reaction occurs during stressful situations um, and that's characterized by you know, feeling nervous or excited. And then you have your delayed stress reaction. And that manifests afterwards. 
those are real fun too. So uh, you may be able to focus and function during the crisis, but after it's over with, you're just kind of like, it's, it's a buildup of energy afterwards. And that can actually be pretty bad. So you're going to have to learn your stress management techniques to manage that delayed stress for later on. Then we have cumulative stress reaction. I guarantee a lot of y'all have that one. Um, oh, something weird just happened to our stuff. Rob, was that you? I didn't do anything. What's going on? Um, someone took control and turned off um my share. I can't even see anything. Let me get back to it. Hold on a second. Let me try to pull it back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, Michael, you're right. Cortisol does go through the roof and um, the prolonged amount of cortisol also causes um, for people uh, to gain weight. So that's another reason why you have a lot of EMS workers that have a lot of uh, belly fat. That's a that's a thing. So uh, very good on that one, Michael. Um, it kicked me out a minute ago. OK, Tammy, thanks. I don't know what happened, but if everybody's back, we're going to continue on. I think I'm good. I can see what I need to see. So I'm going to keep going. <coughs> OK, so um, remember, we talked about cumulative stress reactions, as the result of the prolonged or excessive stress. <clears throat> and that's where we have our hypertension comes from cancer alcoholism, depression. Guys, there's so many things that can happen from cumulative stress stress reactions. So we really need to be cognizant on how to handle that. Now, acute severe stressors are sudden, they're severe, and they're usually stressful emotional, such as your MCIs, your serious injury, your traumatic death of a child, uh, crash with injuries caused by emergency service providers, and death or serious injury of a coworker. Literally reading that, my heart rate is through the roof. Just reading it, because these are things that I have witnessed. I've had these happen to me before, and probably multiple of you have as well. <clears throat> and so being able to say, okay, I know what that's what's happening in here. I know why it's happening. <sighs> I got to take a breath. OK, that's the start of it. All right. PTSD. Now, this is different. This is post-traumatic stress disorder. It is not just because you went to war. Uh, as a matter of fact, per capita, EMS workers and firefighters and police officers have more than military workers do. Um, because It is per capita. That's why. Um, and it can be uh, there's there's different types of PTSD naturally, and we're not going to get into all of those. But it is characterized by re-experiencing this event. And it's an over-response to outside stimuli that recall the event. It can literally be um, a sound can cause someone to go into a, uh, a PTSD fit. Um, there, are other, there are other things that happen like, okay, startle response is off the chain. <clears throat> that's one of the biggest things that you can see. If you see a coworker that if somebody drops a pin and they jump, that person may actually be suffering from some sort of an alarm response. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, well, they have PTSD. It's automatic. I already know. No, that's not necessarily the, the answer here. However, if you see this, say something, talk to that person, ask them, hey, are you okay? You know, especially if this is like a repeated incident type thing. Depression is another one, disassociative episodes, drinking on the job or just drinking in general all the time, using um, other avenues. Um, <clears throat> so um, you, and you'll see uh, the results from failure to resolve traumatic stress uh, or grief. Okay, so let's recognize stress. Here we go. So there are different signs of stress. Um, <coughs> this is why getting professional help is so important. You're absolutely right. You got to get professional help if necessary. Most, if not all, uh, agencies that I've worked for, I think all the agencies I've 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 worked for, have offered uh, free 
a minimum of like three times to go see a um, a professional and talk to them about things that happen. And we have CISD. There's a whole bunch of different things now, but um, literally make people aware. If you are having issues, make people aware. Be loud about it. It's okay. This is a whole new era. I I grew up in EMS, and and Rob may be able to <clears throat> to back me up on this too. That I come from the 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 generation of EMS workers where oh, okay, you worked this, that, and the other, and you want a, you want a cookie? Why are you crying? Uh, and so we learned to bottle that up. Um, and this is a whole new era. This is, this is great because people are actually able to talk about their feelings. They're able to talk about the situations they've had. And um, I think now more than ever, people are getting more mental, uh, mental health help than ever before. And I think that's just an absolutely amazing thing. Um, <clears throat> so let's get back to here. Recognizing stress. Uh, so what if they're irritable, like really irritable, crazy um, towards everyone? Um, they can't concentrate. And we're not talking about like ADHD can't concentrate. I mean, like they literally just cannot concentrate on one thing for longer. Um, and thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate that. I do. And congratulations for that. Cause it's a big deal. Big, big deal. Um, difficulty sleeping, or maybe they sleep too much, or maybe they don't sleep at all, or maybe they have nightmares, or sometimes night terrors, uh, sad, guilty, uh, anxiousness, hopelessness, loss of appetite, isolation. They stop talking about going on vacation. They stop talking about what they, you know, what they're going to give somebody for Christmas. They, they're stopping talking about future things because they're they're living in the past. Okay. All right, so tactics to alleviate stress reaction, uh, change work hours, cut back on overtime. Yeah, that's a great thing. As I sit here and blink, um, I, like you, have to have a job. So that doesn't make sense to me at all, right? Uh, until you have to change jobs because it's so bad, which is what a lot of us do, okay? Um, <clears throat> talk about your feelings. Seek help, okay? This will help you. If you're one of those people, I can't possibly back off on my hours. I can't do this. I have to work. Fine. Let's find another avenue for you. Let's go talk about it. Um, let's adopt some sort of relaxed physiological outlook, okay? Or philosophical, not physiological. Hey, physiological too. Let's go work out. That's another one. That causes uh, endorphins and enkephalins to move through our bodies, which causes our dopamine to go up. And that helps with depression and stress management all at the same time. So it's definitely something that I would absolutely work on. Um, and then, of course, physiological. Uh, busy, sorry, philosophical outlook, uh, you know, uh, religious outlooks, things of that nature. Um, oh, sorry, let me get back here. Uh, it's not the event, but the person's reaction that determines the level of stress. So what that means is that, let me take a step back for you for two seconds. Uh, there are 42 people here in the chat. 42 people stub their toe. They're big toe. 42 people, and we're talking about the exact same amount um, of pressure and everything else, okay? 42 people, 43 now, will have a different idea of pain. Every single one of us. Some, it's going to, oh, it's a one. Some people are going to say it's a 10 on, the, on the, the pain scale. Zero being no pain at all, 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt in your life, okay? Some people are going to say it's a 10. Some people are going to say it's a five. Some people are going to say it's a four. Some people are going to say, well, it's a two if I wiggle it around. Okay, everybody's different. It's the same thing with a reaction to stress. Every single person is different. Just because you were there at the exact same time as someone else does not mean that you witnessed and experienced the event the same way they did. So please keep that in mind. Um, and that helps with um, prejudgment because a lot of people still judge. All right, so CISM or um, critical incident stress management is such a big deal. This is developed to address acute stress situations, and it literally has been proven to go in and decrease the likelihood of PTSD from developing. And what it does is it just kind of confronts that response to the critical incident and diffuses it. Uh, CISM can occur formally, it can be informal, and it can be just like a debriefing. 
of like what happened at the scene. Like, what did you see? What did you do? Um, you do have trained CIS and professionals that facilitate these things. Um, and it can be um, before re-entering a scene, during the assessment for the distress, during scene demobilization, diffusing situ, uh, or excuse me, uh, during scene demobilization. So there's a lot of different times when CISM can actually occur. Most of the CISM that we're gonna that you're gonna see probably in your career are gonna be well after the call is completely over. But we have something called diffusing sessions, and this is where the group informally discusses events they experience together. And it just educates each person on the expectations over like what we expected from each person to do. And it also helps us express our feelings from what we saw. And these debriefings are supposed to be held between 24 to 72 hours of a major incident, because this is what we have found that that helps to uh, diffuse the prolonged stress felt from some of these things, okay? All right, uh, burnout, huge. Whew. A lot of people burn out. Don't get burned out. What is burnout? It's exhaustion of physical or emotional strength, okay? If we know how to handle burnout, we won't get burned out. And I think that's part of the whole mental health issue is that now we are learning how to handle things prior to getting to this point. Whereas years ago, especially in the paramedics of, of my years, um, I remember when I began, my first five paramedic partners were all burned out and it was it no one talked about it it was just they were all mad all the time about everything um they didn't want to come to work but they couldn't you know not leave they were always tired they were always uh upset about something and so that's classic burnout so and that's uh, that is from that chronic unrelieved stress pent-up frustration and they they just you know, people just don't want to do what they what they set out to do. This is a this is a passionate field. OK, almost every single person that I've ever taught has said, I have a passion for helping others. I want to help others. I need to help others. And so when you have people that are very passionate about their field and they turn around, and they're like, I really just don't want to go to work anymore. There's a problem. OK. <clears throat> now, how do we prevent burnout? Remember, I said, let's take care of our own help. Stop going through drive throughs and then slinging, you know, uh, French fries through the window. That's one. Go work out a little bit. Go take a stroll. You don't have to work out. Go take a stroll outside under the sun. It's nice. OK, soak up some some vitamin D. OK, um, learn how to relax. That sounds like a loaded question. Not going to lie or not question, but a loaded statement. <laughs> learn to relax. If I knew how to relax, I wouldn't be in this situation. Um, <clears throat> but what you can do is there's a ton of information on the internet. There's a ton of information that even the places that you work can help you with on learning how to relax. And each person is different. Some people are able to meditate with breathing techniques. Other people go in and bake cookies, okay? No two people are really 100% alike. So you just have to find your own way. Um, do not make unreasonable demands, okay? Just don't do it. The if you don't, I will. Don't do this. Um, and debrief after some tough calls. Peer support and suicide prevention is so huge too. Recognizing that you and your colleagues are becoming overwhelmed, pretty big. Okay. Look, understand, realize that there's a situation going on and see them struggling or understand that you're struggling and be able to speak out about it. Okay. And make sure those people get get help wellness i've already talked about this until i'm blue in the face almost not quite but nutrition we got to eat better guys we got to drink plenty of water i cannot say that enough uh and i say avoid sugary drinks um i bet if i asked in the chat how many of y'all have had an energy drink today can you put in the chat me if you've had an energy drink in the past 24 hours go ahead I'll, I'm not going to wait, but I, I want y'all to put it in the chat. So there's already one. Um, <clears throat> there's there's like 44 of you. Um, I guarantee at least 20 of y'all have had had an energy drink today. There's I, I like that. <laughs> I like the hands. That was good. Um, drink pre-workout at 0500 this morning. Yes, that's that is definitely one of those. <laughs> Um, Chad, I'm right there with you. I'm starting to slow down talking. Uh, not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so what we what we need to do is kind of put those today was a necessary day for it. I I understand. I understand. I get it. Um, but 
we need to put those to the side and drink a lot more of the H2O because this helps so much. And let me tell you something, brain clarity is so much better when you drink more water. It's ridiculous. Like I didn't know, I challenge each one of you not to eat junk food for seven days. I challenge you and I challenge you while you're doing it to drink more water and see what happens. You'll actually be able to like concentrate on things. It's crazy. Maybe that's just me. Maybe it's just me and my ADHD. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. So exercise and relaxation, same thing. You don't have to go and work out for four hours in a gym, guys. You don't have to do that. Um, but just go outside and take a nice stroll. Maybe not in 10 degree weather, but you know what I mean? Like get out, let the sun get on your face and, and soak up all of that. Uh, move your body, do something. Uh, you just, my kids get up and dance all the time. It's ridiculous. And you know what? My four-year-old thinks it's the best thing in the world when mommy gets up and dances with her, okay? So guess what I do? I get up and dance, okay? So it's part of my exercise. My relaxation is I read a book every single night until I fall asleep. That's part of my my mental health, okay? Uh, circle, I've heard a circle. Dance it out, yes, that's it. Uh, don't smoke. And if you don't smoke already, don't start. <laughs> don't vape, that's another one. <laughs> sleep, uh, regular and uninterrupted. I have to say I can't go by this. <laughs> I've had insomnia since I had my first kid. and. Uh, no, I've had like four surgeries and still couldn't sleep through the night. <laughs> so um, I am not good with the sleep part, but, but quality is such a big deal. So if you only get four hours of sleep, as long as it's uninterrupted and for the most part, like free of nightmares and free of dreams and free of all the other stuff, Hey, that's pretty good quality. So that's good. You want to, you want to really amp up for those kinds of sleep qualities. Don't take naps during the day. I know that's crazy. I shudder to think I used to do 72 hour shifts. And if somebody had told me not to take a nap, I don't know that I would have called them a nice name. But anyway, disease prevention, guys, know your family's health history. If you know you have cardiovascular disease in your history, guys, automatically assume you're going to have it too. It's genetic. OK, take care of yourself and adjust your lifestyle is necessary. Balancing work, family and health. Guys, I, I a lot of people think that balance is kind of a dirty word. Um, and I guess sometimes it is, uh, but here's the deal. If I don't dedicate, and this is what I do, and, I, and if, if you're one of those people that's like, balance is such a dirty word, I don't like it, whatever, find pockets of time. I have um, from 6 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. is my pocket of time to get my kids up, get them ready for uh, school, and get them to the bus. That's my pocket of time. That's it. That's That's what I'm doing right here. This is my block. I don't do anything else. I don't do EMS related anything. I don't do um, uh, my hobbies. I don't do anything. It's just my kids, right? That's my block. Then I come over here and I have my block for breakfast or I have my block for uh, working on EMS stuff or I have my block for working on a hobby. And so that's how I, I don't look at it as balance, but it is. Because guys, if we don't have some form of balance or pocket of time that we give to our family, to our work, and to our health, and I mean to ourselves, I don't mean like, look, guys, self-help is not a bubble bath, okay? I'm just gonna let you know, it's just not. Um, I'm a woman, I'm 42 years old, it's it's not a bubble bath, I promise. Um, <laughs> you wanna know what it is? You wanna know what, you wanna know what self help is? Self help is and self help is. It's literally listening to your body, listening to your soul and understanding what you've gone through and being able to handle that in a emotionally uh, ready atmosphere and being able to find that balance of, OK, this happened and now this is what I'm going to do from here on out. OK, that's how you take care of yourself. Um, rotate your schedule. Take time off when possible. Let me go ahead and tell you something, guys. If there's a time to take vacation, do it. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but you're not getting out of love. Okay. We all die. It's okay. Uh, take time for your family and seek help if you're experiencing significant stress. Absolutely. Talk to, talk to anybody. Go get help. Um, diversity on the job. Well, let's talk about workplace issues here. Each person is different. Okay. Um, it's 2024, guys. Respect each other. I think it's ridiculous if you don't. Uh, communicate respectively. 
I'm not going to talk down to any person and I don't expect anyone to talk down to me. I think that's also ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> use cultural diversity as a resource. Learn to relate effectively with other cultures. If you run into a culture that you just don't understand, you know what you can do? I know this isn't like a hip thing, but guess what? You can go ask them. Hey, is I, I, I never want to be offensive. How can I better understand to ask you a question? Or how do I better understand to um, approach you? Okay. There are certain people that you do not look them in the eyes. Okay. Um, of course, we know that there are certain cultures where uh, women are not allowed to show anything on their bodies, period, even down to their ankles. Okay. So there are, we may not understand all of that and what all it encompasses. So we ask questions. It's okay. All right. Do research. Um, learn to uh, relate effectively with other cultures um, and recognize that there are legitimate differences in how various cultures respond to stress. That's another thing. Um, sexual harassment. Obviously, that's not cool. Don't do it. Um, unwelcome verbal or physical conduct, uh, conduct of an over uh, overheard conversation, uh, bad sex jokes. Don't do this, okay? Heading out from class and lab dates and the planner will be approving and pending applications. Planner starting. Thank you so much, Rob. Have a great night. Um, <clears throat> we are going to finish up this and probably get into part of chapter three, okay? Um, perceptions, um, perceptions, not intent matter. Um, keep the lines of communication open. Report harassment to supervisors immediately and keep notes. And substance abuse, we have an increased risk and tension on the job naturally, and it can lead to poor treatment decisions. Um, and guys, if you find a coworker that you think is addicted to a substance and you think they're stealing or whatever the case may be, go ahead and let's get that out. OK, because here's the deal. I don't want one of y'all as my students to uh, come to my house and deal with one of my kids if you're on something. I don't. Do I want to help you? Absolutely. I'll help you. I'll, I'll help you every single day of the week. But I don't want you exposing a family member of mine to something that's bad, like a bad decision that you've made. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to you guys. I treat everyone as though they're my family when I'm on the truck. And so the reverse is also true. When you come into my home, I want you to treat me like I'm your family. <laughs> and if you are using drugs and alcohol and things like that, you're, you're not going to do that. You're not going to be in your tip top shape. Okay. Okay. So death and dying is likely to occur somewhere other than the home, right? Quite suddenly after a prolonged uh, terminal illness, you're going to face death. You're going to see it in the field. You're going to call people um, in the field. Um, and this is just something that happens. But here's what they don't tell you that I'm going to tell you. It's in the chapters right here. There's stages of grieving. There's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Okay. And we're not going to go through all those because there's a self-explanatory. But you guys go through that too. Okay. Uh, one of the most difficult uh uh, shifts I ever worked, and I'm, I will not get into it because I'm not into like war stories. But one of the most difficult shifts that I worked, I worked multiple cardiac arrest in a row, and didn't get a one of them back. And it was okay. Coroner's here on scene. Got to go to the next one. Okay. Police are on scene with this one, releasing the body. Got to go to the next one. And there was never a time to process that information. And at the end of that shift, I did, along with my partner and the student we had with us, we went through grief. We went through stages of grief together and um, obviously apart. So these are things that you're going to have that will happen to you. Working with family members, use special, uh, special care with dying patients and family members and be concerned about their privacy and wishes and be honest with them, okay? Hey, guys, I'm sorry. Um, there's nothing we can do. Either they, you know, most of the time they understand. Sometimes they don't. Ask them how you can help. Is there a clergy member that I can call for you? Okay. Never, ever, 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 ever say you know how somebody feels. Okay. Remember when we talked about stubbing our toe? Remember how we talked about um, being in the same situation at the same time with 43 other people 
and we all have a different experience, guess what? You can have the exact same experience as me with death and dying, but don't you dare say how you, that you know how I feel because you don't. Don't you dare. That's offensive. That's that's more offensive than anything that you could call me. Just don't do it. And 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 even to yourselves, think about someone coming to you and saying, "Oh, I know how you feel. I'm so sorry for your loss. I know how you feel." Are you serious? That's pretty rude, right? Even if they didn't mean to be rude. And some people just like to put filler words out there and I know how you feel is one of those. Just don't do it, okay? Um, allow the patient and family to grieve and maintain a professional attitude. So dying patients know death's going to happen and they may feel a little threatened. And you're going to see this in table 2-10. You're going to see anxiety, pain, fear, anger, hostility, depression, dependency. Um, and you guys can continue to read on your own. Do not make light of a patient's uh, pain or fear. And guys, some of these people, they can have anxiety attacks when when ready for end of life. Some have hallucinations. There's a lot of people that have stories of um, their their loved one is laying in a bed and they're talking to a long lost loved one that, that passed on uh, before that person. Um, there's a lot of different things that can happen during this time. Uh, dealing with the death of a child, whew, a tragic and dreaded event, obviously, and help the family through the initial period after the death, okay? Um, provide as much information and even follow-up counseling, support services. Um, one thing I, I do want you to understand is if the child is dead, acknowledge that. Acknowledge it as fact. And if possible and appropriate, allow the parents to hold the child and do not overload the parents with a lot of information. Just don't. Uh, reactions can be shock, disbelief, violence. There's a lot of different things that can happen. Some parents don't show any emotion at all. Uh, so be be ready for that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so caring for critically ill and injured patients. Let the patient know who you are, what you're doing, that you're attending to his or her immediate needs, and avoid sad and grim comments like, oh, that doesn't look good. Um, that's pretty terrible. Um, so, hey, my name is Patricia. I'm with the ambulance company. I am coming here to take your blood pressure because you... Um, you know, look really pale. And, and I heard you passed out. What all is going on today? I don't know about blood pressure. Like, I don't know where that came from right out of the top of my head. I think because it looks like he might be doing something with a blood pressure. I don't know. Um, but make sure that you introduce yourself. There's nothing more uh, wary than uh, walking into a room and not knowing who you're dealing with. Okay. All right. So um, give the patients the opportunity to express their fears and concerns, uh, respect their religious customs and the patient's needs and orient the patient and just be honest, be completely honest with them. Like, hey, this is what we're about to do. This might not feel good. OK. Um, and then deal with possible initial refusal of care. That does happen from time to time. Uh, go ahead and impress upon this patient that like, hey, this could be a life or death situation. We don't want that to happen to you, right? Um, even if it is a life or death. I mean, obviously, if they're critically ill, it is a life or death situation. But I mean, hey, we need to go to the hospital. Let's go, you know? Um, but at the same time, don't give too much hope, but allow for hope, if that makes sense. Um, if you're dealing with a child, care for them as you would an adult and ask a, um, okay, Joshua, be careful. Ask a responsible adult to accompany a child, okay? So what if we have an uncertain situation? Sometimes it's unclear if the medical emergency even exists. So go ahead and put the monkey on the back of the med control physician and call them. Um, and many minor signs uh, may be early indicators of severe illness or injury. And if in doubt, acquire patient consent and go ahead and just transport. Um, just, just do that. 